Hi, welcome to rosetransfusion.com. I'm Tom Rafe, Director of Transfusion Services at University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics. Today we're going to talk about platelet refractoriness, a fairly common problem in blood banks in major institutions. Here's an outline of what we're going to talk about today. First of all, what is platelet refractoriness? Secondly, why does it happen? And then when it happens, what are we going to do about it? So, definitions of platelet refractoriness, clinical platelet refractoriness, means repeated failure to achieve a satisfactory response to platelet transfusions from random donors. So, the key thing here is a repeated failure and satisfactory responses. Let's talk about those things. What is a satisfactory response to a platelet transfusion? Well, obviously, in a clinical setting for many uses of platelets, it's cessation of bleeding. In a surgical setting, usually the provider is looking for uh, the control of hemorrhage. However, many platelet transfusions are given in a prophylactic setting or in a setting on a floor. And in that case, the clinician most often wants to see a rise in the platelet count. So there's three ways that we think about how you measure a rise in a platelet count. The first way is the simplest, and that's to look for a simple increment in platelet count. What was the platelet count before the transfusion? What was the platelet count after the transfusion? The second way to do that is to take into account the uh, blood volume of the patient and the uh, count of the platelets in the bag that was given. And that would be a way to calculate the percentage of platelet recovery. And there are some norms about which we think about a satisfactory transfusion in the sense of a percentage of platelets recovered in the, in the circulation. And then the third approach, which is commonly used in clinical trials and in our institution, is to calculate a corrected count increment, which takes into account not only the dosage of platelets in the bag, but also the body surface area of the patient, which is a way of estimating their blood volume. In most settings, the easiest way to assess the success of a platelet transfusion is just looking at the increment in the platelet count. And this is the way that most clinicians will look at their patient's response to a transfusion. And the way to calculate it is very simply, you look at the post-transfusion platelet count and you subtract the pre-transfusion platelet count. Let's say they start with a platelet count of 8,000, it goes up to 12,000, the uh, increment is then 4,000. As a rule of thumb, in the average size adult, a satisfactory transfusion is around an increment of 10,000 per microliter. That's very much of a rule of thumb. Now let's look at percentage recovery. Here we take into account the dose of the platelet and the blood volume. So first we calculate the increment, then we take into account the blood volume. Now how do we do that? Well, in the average adult, their blood volume is going to be something like 70 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. We think of the average size adult as having about a 5 liter blood volume, so in the example I put in 5 liters here. And then the dose of platelets is something one either estimates or, in some cases, it's actually provided on, let's say, an apheresis platelet unit. In most cases, the value of 4 times 10 to the 11 platelets per uh, bag of platelets is a reasonable estimate of the dose of a sample. So for this calculation, let's say that there was an absolute increment of 20,000 platelets per microliter. A 5 liter blood volume, we're going to convert that to microliters so that the units are kept even, so that's basically multiplying by a million, and then divide that by 4 times 10 to the 11th, the average dose of a bag of platelets. So the math works out here, and that 20,000 increment works out to be about a 25% um, recovery, percentage recovery of platelets. So you'll notice right away that is actually relatively surprisingly small, right? So when you transfuse a bag of platelets, it's a decent response to get only 25% of what was in the bag recovered in the circulation. Now let's look at the corrected count increment. The corrected count increment is very similar to the percentage recovery. You calculate the absolute increment, but in this case you use the body surface area, which is usually in the medical record, it's used all the time by the pharmacy, for example, in meters squared. And then once again, you divide by the dose of platelets in the bag. Let's use the example that there was an increment of 10,000 per microliter in the transfusion, and then a reasonable estimate for an average size adult is about 2 meters squared 
body surface area, and the dose again, 4 times 10 to the 11th platelets. You do the math. That corrected count increment for an absolute increment of 10,000 works out to be about 5,000. I tell residents, for the average size adult, that's about the same as taking the absolute increment and dividing by 2. You can do that mental math in a matter of seconds. For corrected count increments, the rule of thumb for a successful transfusion is about half what it would be for an absolute increment then. So a target of 5,000 is very commonly used in clinical trials and in papers on this topic. So that's increment. What about repeated failure? Well, for one thing, uh, one failure of a plate of transfusion in any patient means nothing at all. It's extremely common, and we'll look at some data in a, in a minute, to have no response at all to platelets or an inadequate response. There are many, many reasons why that might happen. So in clinical trials and in clinical practice, the key thing is to have two failures of platelet transfusions consecutively. And in clinical trials and our clinical practice, that is what defines potential refractoriness, repeated failure. There is a very important component of the time factor when measuring the post-transfusion platelet count, and this is, I think, very much underappreciated by healthcare providers. And so the, the rule, of, or rather the, the standard of care for calculating a corrected count increment or any increment from a platelet transfusion is to get a post-transfusion platelet count at about the one hour time point after the transfusion. So you see that all the time in textbooks and literature, a one hour post-transfusion platelet count. In reality, that doesn't happen very often in our institution. So here's data from a study I did looking at our, our own records in our hospital, University of Wisconsin. And I went in and looked at daily transfusion records for platelet transfusions and I selected single unit transfusions of platelets and then I looked for pre and post transfusion platelet counts and the time between when the platelet was dispensed from the blood bank and when the time stamp was put on the sample for the post transfusion platelet count. So here's one hour, two hours, three hours, etc. And you can see then when I put a regression curve on that there's a very strong relationship between time after the dispensing of the platelet when the sample was obtained and the absolute platelet increment on this scale as well, R squared value of 0.5. The key thing I would note here is that when I looked at transfusions that had a post-transfusion platelet count at one hour after the transfusion, the regression line shows that the platelet absolute increment was around 40,000 per microliter, but three hours when the, when the uh, when the sample was obtained approximately three hours after the plate that was dispensed, that value is half of what it was at one hour. Most clinicians probably don't appreciate that. And five hours after, it's one quarter of what it would have been at this hour. So if you have a patient, a clinician, who's worried about response to platelet transfusions, this is an extremely important variable to consider. And if you're looking at values in the record that are three, four, five hours after the platelet transfusion, you have to think about correcting for that back to that one hour because all of the data from clinical trials goes back to that one hour post-transfusion platelet count. This was a survey I did, again, at University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics. I looked at a week's worth of platelet transfusions just to see what were the parameters that we were working with. 124 transfusions during that week. More than, or almost half of those uh, platelet transfusions, the clinician never got a post-transfusion platelet count. So in clinical practice, oftentimes the blood banker doesn't have a lot of information to work with. In 30, out of 72 transfusions where there was a post-transfusion platelet count, there was a negative increment. Now, many of these are probably in the surgical setting or a variety of other settings, but 42% of the transfusions had a negative increment. And those transfusions where the corrected count increment, or the, excuse me, the absolute increment was less than 10,000, which would be considered an unsatisfactory transfusion, 12 out of 72 or 17 percent were in that range. 17 percent of transfusions where there was a post-transfusion platelet count would be considered unsatisfactory. So the key thing here is that it's not a bit uncommon to see 
unsatisfactory responses to transfusions. What else did I see? Looking at just those where there was a positive increment in uh, the platelet count afterward, uh, the, pre, or the median pre-transfusion platelet count was 40,000 per microliter in those patients. The median post count was 83,000. The median increment was 38,000 per microliter, but most of these were actually multiple units of transfusions or, or multiple units of platelets that were transfused. So the median increase per unit was actually 22,000 per microliter. So I look at that as being in our hospital, all comers around 20, 22,000 uh, uh, platelets per microliter as an increment is a pretty satisfactory uh, response. That's a pretty common response. So what are the factors that affect response to transfusions and um, increment? This is work from Cheryl Schlichter. Cheryl Schlichter is one of the uh, most well-known platelet researchers in the world, actually, out in Seattle. Washington has published a lot of studies on platelet transfusions. These are negative factors in terms of the uh, response to platelet transfusions in patients. The most important, and this is actually the absolute increment, the decrement, or what one would expect to be a decrease from the expected, um, increment in platelet count after a transfusion. Multiple pregnancies has almost 9,000 per microliter average impact, negative impact on the uh, post-transfusion uh, increment. Being male, for whatever reason, almost 6,000 per microliter, uh, less than average. Not surprisingly, having a palpable spleen in the patient reduces the expected increment by 3,500 per microliter. Gamma irradiation of the unit itself, which causes some radiation damage to the platelets, almost 3,000 per microliter, and then you see a number of other factors that have negative influence on the expected increment in platelet count. These are almost all patient factors except gamma irradiation. I'm going to point to this one because this transfusion sequence number was recognized more recently by Dr. Schlichter and her colleagues. It has a modest effect on any individual transfusion, a negative effect. So what do we mean by that? Well, look at some figures from this paper. This is the same paper by Dr. Schlichter. And what we have are two charts here. We have all the patients in this particular study, and then we have those who have no evidence of an HLA antibody and therefore no reason to be immune refractory to platelet transfusions. There are three lines on the graph. The top one is one hour post-transfusion platelet counts after a single unit of platelets given. This line down here is 18 to 24 hour count after the transfusion. What's interesting about this, in all patients there is a steady decline in the post-transfusion uh, platelet count increment as a function of the number of transfusions they received. Here, so if these were daily transfusions, after about a week or so, you can see that the expected increment in platelet count following a transfusion declines by something like six or 8,000 per microliter. And then that decline continues thereafter. Even in patients with no evidence of HLA antibodies in this cohort, that phenomenon occurs just the same. There's something about giving repeated platelet transfusions that causes patients to gradually respond less well in terms of their post-transfusion increment. That's another factor that should be considered when you're looking at patients who have received a lot of platelet transfusions during their course of therapy. The ABO type of the platelet unit is very important too, and of course of the recipient. There are two kinds of ABO compatibility or incompatibility, as we all know. Minor incompatibility is transfusing plasma that contains isoagglutinins that would recognize cells like red blood cells or platelets uh, in the bloodstream of the recipient. What we're talking about here is major incompatibility, which means transfusing cells that have antigens, A or B antigens, that would be recognized by isoagglutinins that are in the circulation of the recipient. A simple example would be transfusing a type A, in this case platelet, to a patient who is type O in their plasma. Uh, 
So, as it says here, platelets have A and B antigens on their membranes. So this becomes important, and I'll show you here. This is work that was done at University of Iowa. We did a study where we looked at the platelets donated by just five donors who donated many, many, many platelets over a long period of time. These were the ABO types of these five donors. So three of them were type O, one was type A, and one was type AB. Let's look at the overall corrected count increments from these five donors. You can see that from the type O donors in the range of about 9 to 13,000 was where the mean CCI was. What about the type A patient? Well, when the type A, excuse me, donor, their overall CCI was around 9,000, similar to this one, but it made a big difference whether these platelets were transfused into an ABO compatible, a type A patient who would not have anti-A antibodies, or a type O, which is a fairly common event, where the increment is very much smaller than if it were given to a type A. So this illustrates that the ABO type of these donors and recipients makes a difference. Much more prominent with the type AB donors. Note how low the overall CCI is for this AB donor. Note how extremely low it is when given to type O recipients who have both anti-A and anti-B in their plasma compared to when they were given to a type A or a type B patient where the success was much better because these patients only have either anti-A or anti-B. ABO is an important first consideration when you have patients who appear to be refractory and you've been potentially giving them platelets that had a major in ABO incompatibility. So there are also positive factors that influence the response to platelet transfusions. Just the opposite of the negative factor of a enlarged spleen, a splenectomy and a transfusion recipient has a huge impact on their expected increment, almost 25,000 per microliter if they're splenectomized. That alone tells you that the spleen has a lot to do with refractoriness to platelet transfusions of all kinds. Uh, ABO compatibility, we just discussed in this study, another one by Cheryl Slichter, almost 5,000 per microliter uh, difference between ABO compatible and not compatible platelets. Platelets that are stored less than 48 hours, fresher platelets do a little bit better, 2,000 per microliter, and there's a small effect on the age of the recipient. <clears throat> now, so with that background, let's look at alloimmunization because alloimmunization to HLA antibodies is the, uh, is the problem with platelet refractoriness that we can work around in the blood bank. So this is a TRAP study. The TRAP study was a trial to reduce alloimmunization to platelets conducted back in the 1990s, published in the New England Journal in 1997. This trial randomized patients with acute myelogenous leukemia to receive either leukoreduced or non-leukoreduced platelets, and the hypothesis that was being tested was that leukoreduction of platelet units would reduce the production of HLA antibodies or alloimmunization in those patients that received this platelet. And so these are the non-leukoreduced platelet cohort, this is a leukoreduced platelet cohort, and these are just the the uh, results of the study uh, with respect to platelet transfusion, 16% of the patients in the cohort that received non leukoreduced platelets eventually became refractory. They met the definition of refractoriness, two consecutive CCIs less than 5,000. In the leukoreduced unit, that was, that was diminished by half. So right away we can see that leukoreduction decreases the incidence of refractoriness. What about HLA antibody production? 45% of the patients who got non leukoreduced platelets produced HLA antibodies, only 19% in the leukoreduced group, so that was reduced by half as well. And that was the main outcome of the study. Leukoreduction definitely decreases the likelihood of developing HLA antibodies. Now, in terms of looking at refractoriness to platelet transfusions that is associated with HLA antibody, which is the kind of problem that we can potentially do something about, only 13% of the patients that got non leukoreduced platelets actually had HLA antibodies in conjunction with refractoriness. Remember, 16% was refractory, so somewhat less, 
of the patients here actually had HLA antibodies as a part of the problem. Over here, that's even more dramatic. 8% were refractory. Only 4% of these eight uh, of the uh, total patients in this cohort actually had HLA antibody with their refractoriness. So right away you can see that refractoriness is far more common than refractoriness associated with HLA antibodies. And HLA antibodies being present is far more common than being refractory with HLA antibodies. Now let's move forward about 20 years. Another study, this was a study to compare platelet dosages, another large multi-institutional study. And this is a post hoc analysis with interest in looking at alloimmunization in these patients here. Now in this study, all of the patients got leukoreduced platelets. And one other feature I will point out is that 20 years hence, the leukoreduction reduction uh, methodologies had improved quite a lot. Uh, they're now using third and what they call third and fourth generation leukoreduction reduction filters. So you'll see that in the results here. Here, the overall allo immunization rate was only 5%. So that was reduced by 75% from the earlier study. The refractiveness rate overall is about 12.5%. And the allo immunization rate with refractiveness, that combination of two problems that we can do something about, was only 8% of the patients who were refractory. Only eight patients out of 102 actually had HLA antibodies with refractoriness. In terms of the overall HLA-associated refractoriness, only 1% of these 800 patients had refractoriness to platelet transfusions associated with production of HLA antibodies. All right, so let's summarize these two studies because this is really important information about what really happens clinically. This study in the 1990s, 20% overall refractory rate, but five times as many patients had HLA antibodies produced than actually became refractory to platelet transfusions, and one and a half times as many patients were refractory than actually had HLA antibodies. The PLATO study 20 years later, only 1% of all the patients in the study were refractory altogether. There were five times as many HLA antibody positive patients than there were refractory patients. So the problem of developing HLA antibodies is five times more common than refractoriness to platelet transfusions. And about two and a half times as many patients were refractory without having HLA antibodies. Now, supposing we have a patient who is identified as being potentially refractory by a clinician, they're asking for your help. So the first question is, is the patient refractory to platelet transfusions by some problem that they can benefit potentially from HLA matched platelets or any form of matched platelets? Here are a couple of case studies that illustrate that that's not always the case. So here's a case that illustrates a problem of refractoriness that is not associated with HLA antibody. This was a 63-year-old female. She had a history of asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, Lyme disease, presented with severe thrombocytopenia. In the chart it said bright red blood per rectum with her bowel movement today prompted her to present to urgent care. There was found to have platelet count of zero. Let's take a look. The impression was that X is a 63-year-old female history of asthma, remote Lyme disease who presents with severe thrombocytopenia, as well as likely babesiosis infection, as seen on peripheral blood smear. Oh, so what did it look like from the point of view of her platelets? So the team, having a platelet count of zero in their patient, quite naturally transfused platelets, and over this period of about a week right here, they gave 24 units of platelets, a lot of platelet transfusions. Here was the platelet count. You can see no response to any of these platelet transfusions, 24 platelets until this point right here. And then the platelet count started to rise up to 100,000 and then went up from there. Is this a case where we can help this team of doctors uh, by providing HLA mesh platelets? No. Obviously, this thrombocytopenia was something that was present during an infection with babesiosis, and then it went away when they treated the patient. 
Here's what they did. They gave the patient prednisone, IVIG, l trombopag which is a drug that helps the patient's bone marrow produce more platelets, and then put them on antimicrobials to treat the babesiosis. Their final diagnosis it was ITP, associated with babesia infection and exacerbating the thrombocytopenia. So this is clinical refractoriness to play with transfusions, but nothing to do with HLA refractoriness and nothing that the blood bank can do directly to help this patient. Here's why. Three-year-old female, complex medical history, Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, a number of other things, nematocele, subglottic stenosis, cleft palate, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, et cetera, et cetera. She was admitted to the pediatric ICU for respiratory failure and ARDS. She had parainfluenza virus and pseudomonas pneumonia. They called us, the transfusion service, they called the transfusion service to consider providing HLA match platelets because the patient wasn't responding to platelet transfusions. Let's look at what actually was going on with the patient here. Platelet counts uh, for the patient on the uh, y-axis here. These were six platelet transfusions given over a period of about seven days. In this patient, you can see that there were platelet given here not a little bit of a response here, another platelet, really the plate, the plate count went down, another platelet, no response, another platelet, inadequate response, no response, and then finally the patient's platelet count returned. So did this patient have clinical refractoriness due to HLA? Possibly, but probably not. Why? Because the platelet count went up all by itself and there was no need to invoke HLA match platelets as a solution to this problem. Patient Z, a 66-year-old male, history of recurrent mantle cell lymphoma, had had rituximab chop, a lot of chemotherapy, now has high-risk therapy-related acute myelogenous leukemia, had induction therapy, salvage therapy, etc. A lot of chemotherapy, presents with neutropenic fever. Remember, fever is on the list of comorbidities that can reduce your response to platelet transfusions. This Patient on, uh, in October had nosebleed thrombocytopenia in the setting of refractory thrombocytopenia. We'll transfuse with HLA matched platelets today and follow up with post transfusion platelet count to assess responsiveness. Their goal, the HEMOC team, was to get the platelet count and keep it above 10,000 per microliter. This patient had HLA antibodies. This PRA or percent reactive antigen is one of the tests that we use. 35% means that that patient had a response to about 35% of the HLA phenotypes in that particular test. So clearly, HLA antibodies present and not responding to platelet transfusions. Let's look at what happened. So the patient had gotten six units of platelets over a period of time. This was the absolute platelet count during that period of time. Hovered around 10,000 per microliter. These six transfusions had very little effect on any of the platelet counts during this period of time. Then we introduced HLA matched platelets and we gave the patient five HLA matched platelets. The first one seemed to work pretty well. This is an increment of 9,000 per microliter, almost what we would can call a satisfactory response. But the rest of these four other transfusions really no effect at all. So what do we learn from this? Well, HLA matched platelets might help in some cases, but they don't always help. So how do we do HLA antibody testing? There are two uh, main ways of doing that. The historical way it's been around for decades is what they call the percent reactive antigen. In this particular test, the, uh, the, they utilize lymphocytes of known HLA phenotype in a micro titer format. And it's a test that's used a lot for uh, transplant candidates. They call it the leukocytoclastic antibody method, leukocytoclastic antibodies. And what they do is put in the well of the microtiter plate uh, a small aliquot of many, many, many different kinds of lymphocytes with different HLA phenotypes on them and then add serum from the patient. And if the patient has HLA antibodies that recognize cognate antigens on any of those lymphocytes, they'll bind, fix complement, poke holes in the membrane, and then they add dye to the well. And a living lymphocyte that's healthy will exclude that dye. One that has been attacked by antibodies will not and will turn the color of the dye. So it's a dye exclusion test. 
And by looking at the reaction in all the different wells that they've tested that way, they can calculate a percentage of those wells where there was antibody present. That's called the PRA, very commonly done. Uh, another approach to all of this is solid phase. In this case, it's a, an approach where they simply harvest the antigens from lymphocytes and put those antigens themselves directly on the well of the plate. And then they add plasma or serum from the patient and then they can wash and add an indicator red blood cell or some other method and look and see which of the wells uh, had that, uh, had uh, binding of the patient antibody onto the bottom of the well. So it's very similar to the PRA in that sense. And again, they can calculate the percentage of wells that were reacting. So those are the two main methods that we've seen. When it comes to actually matching platelets in the blood bank for donors who have HLA antibodies, there are two main types of approaches that are done here. So one is to provide platelets that are actually phenotype matched for the patient. So in order to do that, you have to have recipient HLA typing done. So we have to know what the HLA typing of the, uh, of the patient is, and then, very similar to with red blood cells, we can select platelet units that exactly match that HLA type. Another way to get around that without having such a restrictive approach is to actually look at the patient's antibody profile, as you might do with the PRA test I just showed you, and see what kinds of phenotypes of antibodies that patient's making. And then you can select platelet units that do not possess uh, the, anti, uh, the antigen that's cognate to the antibodies that are present. This is more analogous to what we do with red blood cells. If we have a patient who has a specific antibody like an anti-cal, we don't match for every antigen, we just find red blood cells that are negative for the cal. That's what's done in this type. This opens up a lot more possibilities for the, for the um, blood provider that's finding HLA matched platelets. So these are uh, HLA matched. Another approach is to skip the whole HLA consideration altogether and just simply take platelets off the shelf and incubate them with the plasma of the patient to see whether or not there's a reaction. So uh, this would be the analogy of if you had no ability to test for unexpected antibodies in a, in a patient with red cells, Transfusions, you simply get red blood cell units off the shelf and do a serological, cro serological cross match at the bench, and you look for units that are non reactive and you transfuse those units. That is a very quick way of doing that. There are kits that are available for that. So these are two very different approaches, very much used out there for providing HLA match playlists. Now, when it comes to these methods, how well do they work? There was a study done at the University of Minnesota. Several years ago, they had 354 transfusions in just 32 patients who were refractory to platelet transfusions. Among these 354 transfusions, 161 were unselected units, just random units. 152 were cross-matched, and 41 were HLA-matched. So they had both of these methods going here. So what were the results from that? Well, the median CCIs from the group where the platelets were unselected, zero. So obviously that was the worst outcome when there was no selection at all. Interestingly though, when they use cross-matched platelets, these 41 transfu or these 152 transfusions, the median CCI was only 1.7, which is, means that obviously it's not a perfect solution because we would like to see a CCI of 5,000 or better in every transfusion. When they use HLA matched platelets, the 41 down there, the median CCI was only 1.2. Now looking at individual transfusions, the 354 in the unselected, uh, there were about 12% of those that were acceptable. They had an acceptable CCI, probably because uh, the patient happened to have antibodies that weren't present on the platelets that were given. When they used cross-match platelets though, really only 25% of the cross-match platelets gave an adequate CCI. And when they use HLA match plays, only 29% of the platelet units that were given had an adequate CCI. This tells you right away that this approach, either cross-matching or HLA matching, is not a panacea for this problem. Only about 25 to 30% of the time does it actually work.
summary of what I've just been telling you, platelet transfusion failures are extremely common. In our data at uh, University of Wisconsin hospitals and clinics, more than 50% of the evaluable platelet transfusions had either a negative or insufficient increment for many, many, many reasons. Refractoriness as defined by two consecutive failures was also fairly common. Up to 13% or so of patients become refractory. Clinical refractoriness, as in failure to respond adequately to a platelet transfusion, is anywhere from four to 10 times as common as HLA immune refractoriness, that is refractoriness with the presence of antibody, depending on the study that you're looking at. And HLA immunization itself, the presence of antibody, is five times more common in both the TRAP study and the PLATO study than immune refractoriness. Post-transfusion platelet count time and the ABO compatibility, major compatibility, are very important variables you have to look at when a patient is refractory or apparently refractory. In immune refractory patients, HLA match platelets or cross-matching helps, but they only work in something like 25 to 30 percent of the uh, patients that they're used in. Thank you for your attention, and please visit rosetransfusion.com again.